Bonsoir à tous. Good afternoon, everyone. We are going, going to start session four on surveil surveillance and integrated mapping. My name is Ghislaine Sopo. I am a researcher at the Regional Institute of Public Health in Benin. I worked in the Center of Testing and Treatment uh, in Benin. I work on leprosy um, and yours. We are going to speak about epidemiological surveillance and the, or rather, integrated surveillance and mapping in the analysis of skin NTDs. We know that the basis of all control of, uh, ma of illnesses is surveillance. We need data, which then inform decision-making and planning of actions. This session will enable us uh, to review um, several presentations, and nine, I believe, which will... The first presentation which will enable us to look at the importance of surveillance and mapping and that will be presented by our colleague Michael Max. Secondly, we will talk about yours. A, uh, and then we will hear um, about tungiasis and another fungal infection. We will then speak about the community surveillance system. Um, that's basically what we're going to look at today, in addition to podoconiasis and scabies in Uganda. So if our colleague Michael is ready. Yeah, okay. So you have the floor, Michael, for uh, 20 minutes. Wonderful. Thank you. thank you very much, Chairperson, and thank you to WHO for the opportunity to speak. So I'm going to try and um, situate us a little bit in terms of uh, understanding at a broad level the, where we are and where we would like to get to in terms of surveillance and mapping for skin NTDs. Um, I don't have any conflicts of interest to declare. Um, so I think a lot of us will be familiar with these points, but I just want to um, frame them for those of us um, who do a lot of mapping, maybe these things are familiar, but I want to take us away from the idea of the individual patient and now to really understanding the distributions of patients in populations, be that at a village, a district, a country, or a global scale. Uh, so we know that these diseases predominantly affect uh, rural and marginalized populations. Um, they're difficult, costly, and time-consuming to cheat, and it's, it's hard to reach these individuals. And underpinning all of this is that compared to many of the other diseases, even compared to many of the other neglected tropical diseases, we tend to have a very limited grasp, really, on what the burden and distribution of these diseases are. Um, so, for example, on the first day, Rod uh, showed a map which colored entire countries on the basis of whether or not there was zero, one, two, three, or four, for example, skin NTDs available. But this is, obviously this is a useful sort of high level thinking point, but no one can make a program level decision based on that kind of um, information. So we really need to address that huge gap to, to move forward. And this obviously uh, becomes sort of self-fulfilling. We've had less investment in research and development, so we understand less about the epidemiology of these diseases. Because we don't understand the epidemiology of these diseases, we cannot advocate to funders so successfully to invest. And so we are stuck in a circle, and I guess I'm going to argue that understanding the burden better is a key step to really moving all other uh, aspects forward. Okay, so uh, you'll see my title is about surveillance and mapping, and uh, I'll put it to you that these are different activities uh, which serve different purposes. And in the back of our mind, for all of these, I encourage us to think about what is the programmatic decision? If I go and I measure this thing in a place, in my village, in my community, in my district, in my country, what is it that I'm expecting someone to do with that piece of information? Is the information I'm gathering suitable to make that decision? 
is there even a decision to be made or am I just collecting the information because it would be nice to know? These all have implications. So programmatic mapping, which is what people who work in other parts of NTDs, particularly the MDA-focused MTDs, are very familiar with, is you know, really designed to support decision-making. Uh, there is normally a defined intervention unit, such as a district, uh, and there is normally a threshold around which we are making a decision. Do we or do we not deliver mass drug administration? And so, for example, in the context of skin NTDs, uh, there is a design, defined threshold for mass drug administration for scabies, which is set at 10% currently. And so the purpose of mapping is to decide, is this unit at or below 10% so that a program can decide, should we or should we not do mass drug administration for scabies control? So that is the purpose of programmatic mapping. Second to that, there is surveillance. This is a rolling activity. Okay, mapping tends to be a one-off exercise, or at least done at fairly separated intervals, whereas surveillance, this is a rolling activity, relying either on active or passive case detection to inform the treatment and allocation of individuals as they come. So, for example, we need rolling surveillance of cases of leprosy because we don't know when they'll present and we're not making decisions about a whole district, we're making decisions about individuals. So what comes from that is that surveillance activities often don't provide reliable estimates of burden because they're not done systematically using a well-established sampling frame. And then we have a sort of intermediate step which is used uh, in different names in different places, confirmatory or rapid mapping. This is making an initial decision, is this disease of interest even present. So some of the work re-presented this morning you might have considered to be you know, confirmatory that there was cutaneous leishmaniasis in a district in Cote d'Ivoire. So that was just making a yes, no, th this disease exists. It's not designed to make a decision or be the ongoing surveillance platform. So you can see that these are different kinds of activities uh, and they all require different uh, strategies. And broadly, if we think about the skin NTDs uh, and therefore what kind of activity, the different diseases require different interventions and therefore you, we might consider that they map to different strategies, mapping versus surveillance. So for example, Borrelia, mycetoma, leprosy, leishmaniasis, these are predominantly diseases where it is about treating the individual case. So this is a surveillance focus. Whereas diseases such as yours, onchocerciasis, scabies, mass drug administration is the major strategy. So more of a mapping approach is required in order to make decisions. Uh, and then you have diseases such as uh, lymphatic filariasis in the middle, where the overall strategy may be based on MDA, but morbidity management is clearly based on finding individual cases. So I'm gonna, this is a map that I took from the trachoma program, uh, and I show it just to give an example of the granularity of the decision-making tools that are available for some of the other NTDs. So here you can see that uh, if you compare to example some of the maps we've seen before, uh, countries being divided into very, very small, finely mapped areas, each of, you know, 100,000 to 200,000 individuals. This provides programs with abilities to make decisions at relatively small scale. Uh, and now, I'm just uh, to show that I'm not picking on people, I'll show one of my own maps. Uh, here is a map uh, that we did on the current data on the prevalence of uh, scabies from a, a Lancet paper. And you can see, firstly, that most of the map is not colored in because we simply don't have good quality community data on scabies prevalence for most of the world. We know there is scabies, but we, we don't know the burden. And you can see that we don't have sub-national level data. So all of Brazil is being colored in on the basis of maybe one or two surveys. This is a completely different level of contextual and programmatic decision-making tool compared to what we have uh, in the PC NTDs. And I would argue that we need to be moving towards the level of granularity that the other NTDs have been able to achieve. So some practical considerations. Many of these diseases compared to the PC NTDs are quite rare. There are, relatively speaking, at a population level, not that many cases of leprosy per tens or hundreds of thousands of individuals. And that makes designing uh, surveillance tools to detect rare uh, 
uh, diseases more difficult. You need much larger sample sizes. Many of these diseases have low incidence. That means not many new cases occur over a period of time. So if you have not done any surveillance for Borrelia ulcer for five years and you go and do some surveillance, you will find a big backlog of cases. But how frequently should we go and resurvey to look for the new cases that are emerging when this is a disease where there may only be 100 or 200 new cases occurring in a country in the whole year? They are often uh, in communities that are the most difficult to access, which we know. We know that, relatively speaking, our programs do not have the resources of the trachoma program or the onchocerciasis program to conduct these incredibly detailed uh, surveys. So it's easy for me to say that we should do it, but we need to understand how to mobilize the resources to do that. They are often very, very focal. Uh, my colleagues in Ghana tell me that you can walk along one side of a river and you'll find Borrelia ulcer, and you can walk along the other side of the river and you won't find BU. So how do you really map things at this very, very focal scale? It's much more labor intensive. And as we've heard uh, in Claire's session this morning, we obviously have a gap in terms of addressing how we can train healthcare workers to identify, diagnose, and pick up diseases which are, relatively speaking, much more complicated to diagnose than many of the PC NTDs. Well, everyone has shown a version of this slide, so I won't dwell on it, but we know that we don't have enough dermatologists to address this problem, uh, and several people have highlighted uh, versions of this guide, be it the PDF version, the printed version, or the, or the mobile health version, and this is obviously a step forward, but I think as I emphasized this morning, we really do need to move forward in understanding how reliable the different training programs we are all delivering are, because I want to be able to compare data from Cote d'Ivoire with data from Togo and know that what one person calls a case of scabies is the same in both settings. So we really need to drill down on that. As we've said at the beginning, we need to really have clarity on what the aim is for mapping and surveillance, and that is on uh, WHO and those of us that support WHO uh, with technical guidance on deciding for each disease. What, what are the programmatic decisions that are being made? So are we going for surveillance? Are we going for mapping of what populations with what regularity? And then for those of us that sit in the operational research priority camp, what is the best way to deliver these interventions? We've heard about skin camps, we've heard about school-based surveys, we've heard about house-to-house -house surveys, we've heard about contact tracing. We need studies to understand which of these have the best reach, both in absolute numbers, but also what is the equity of these reach for reaching disadvantaged populations, gender-balanced populations. All of these things need considering, and we really need to address these. I'm going to give uh, one example now from our colleagues in, in Liberia where we attempted to quantify systematically the burden of disease. We're not here attempting to do a programmatic activity, but I want to show how we went about trying to really understand truly what the burden of skin NTDs was in one district uh, of Liberia, and Castle gave a nice presentation on some of this work uh, yesterday. So we um, did a two-stage cluster randomized survey design. This was done because it gives an accurate overall population estimate. So we knew that this would sort of be generalizable to the whole of the population of the, of the uh, Maryland County. So we used uh, community health workers to do initial screening activities, and then that was followed up by more trained, but still not dermatologists, for verification. Uh, and we had QC built in at every step so that we could be confident in the activities that were being undertaken. Uh, so first step, very simple, community healthcare workers using uh, simple electronic uh, data collection and a flip chart of pictures. And they were not trying to diagnose anyone with leprosy or diagnose anyone with borreliosis. simply saying, does anyone in the house have a skin problem that looks like this? And we used that to generate a line list of suspected cases. Following up from that line list, we went to the patient. We didn't expect the patient to come to the facility because we know that the direct and indirect costs of seeking care are a major barrier. So our physician assistants then went door to door and they took samples where they were required. They initiated therapy at the patient's place of living. 
Uh, and we ran this over four months, screening about 57,000 individuals and identifying about 3,000 suspected cases. Uh, and just to say that we found when we did QC that we had a very high report of people saying that they had been screened. 90% of people said that they had been visited during this activity. And here you can see uh, that we found a large burden of skin NTDs. So here are the sort of uh, sub-regions of Maryland County. And you can see that in each of these uh, areas, we were finding a mix of cases of Beruli, leprosy, LF, and yours. But this varied, the case mix varied, from part of the county to part of the county. So if we had only gone looking for Borrelia ulcer, in many parts of the county we would have found nothing and it would have been a wasted activity. But by integrating across several diseases, we were able to do surveillance all at once. Uh, and this is just to compare, as uh, Castle already showed yesterday, this, there had been relatively few cases detected by passive routine surveillance in the preceding period. And we, unsurprisingly, we, when we went and did active case finding, were able to find a large backlog of individuals who are currently unknown. So I think this does show that we can integrate these activities uh, and that there are approaches that can be done for this. As everyone else has already highlighted in various talks, you know, in our survey, 90% of the referrals were not uh, the skin NTDs that we set out to look for. And you can see that we found a large burden of non-NTD fungal infections. But for example, we were looking for LF morbidity. So we found a lot of people with unsurgically corrected scrotal hernias or other hydrocele's, for example. And all of these have implications, as others have commented on, not just on the acceptability of the intervention to programs, but the cost. You know, one of the main costs we had was providing treatment for a very large number of cases of scabies. So I'm coming to the end of my talk now, hopefully on time. Can I go back one slide? Oh. Can you put me... Can you put me back one slide? I think it's finished, so I need Stephanie you to do it. Great. So I, I hope I have shown you, and we're probably already aware, that compared to most other, even compared to many of the other NTDs, we have very limited data, really, on the burden of skin NTDs. And this creates challenges for us when we want to advocate with uh, funders, both existing funders and new funders. And it creates challenges for our colleagues working in ministries about programmatic planning of where to invest their resource and their time, and convincing a Ministry of Health that a Borreliosa program is as worthy as investment as other programs that they are being asked to support. The needs vary between the different skin NTDs, and we need to consider where that is best met through targeted mapping versus rolling surveillance. We need a lot of work, really, on validating the clinical training packages and support tools that we're using <coughs> to ensure that the data we collect across different countries is comparable. And I think we've heard over all of the talks that pilot integration activities really do show promise, but we need more operational research to understand how to best develop these into programmatic tools. And speaking to the director's agenda, you know, the cost and cost effectiveness of different ways of delivering these so that we can go to funders with a budgeted proposal, not just a wish list. Thank you very much. Okay, merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you for respecting the time limit. It was supposed to be 20 minutes long, but you d delivered it in 15. In that presentation, you recalled that neglected tropical diseases are often in focused areas with a low incidence, and we need subtle strategies to achieve a mapping in order to integrate them into our programmatic activities. 
and we need a lot of targeted mapping to understand the endem endemicity and incidence. We need a combination of routine surveillance and targeted surveillance depending on the programmatic needs globally, therefore. Well, that's rather a global look at your presentation. Now I would like to give the floor to my um, colleague. The second presentation is by Yves Bar Barogui. If you're ready, you can have the floor. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Les slides are in English. I'll be speaking French, but the slides are in English. En attendant que... While we're waiting for the slides, Dr. Barogi will be uh, telling us about the endemicity of yours in the 47 countries of the WHO African region in 2022. So it's the results of a survey. C'est bon? OK, voilà. Maybe you could introduce yourself while we're waiting, Eve. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Eve Barogi, the focal point for Burundi, Elsa, and yours in the WHO West African region. Okay, quelques problèmes. Okay, we seem to be experiencing some technical problems. Maybe while we're sorting all of this out, we can take one or two questions on the previous presentation given by Michael. Would anybody like to take the floor? Do you have any questions? Would you like any clarifications? Yes, I can't see your name, unfortunately, but you can take the floor. Please introduce yourself and ask your question. Thank you. Um, Eugene Nathan, Public Health from Australia. I caught up with Michael uh, last evening for dinner and I'm going to ask the same question again. Tell us about the scientific rigour around designing an MDA strategy and the um, program programmatic mapping intervals um, as an example perhaps and if there isn't good scientific rigor you know how can we develop an approach it doesn't matter what the disease is just in, in general concepts thanks Michael I feel like that's a plant um, it's, a, it's a great question um, I think uh, as with a lot of guidance on NTDs uh, the decisions are made with a mix of scientific information uh, practical and logistic considerations uh, and trying to make decisions that are workable for um, programs. I I'll give an example of the SCABES MDA threshold. That's the one I'm most familiar with because I set it. Um, so I think when that was set, we considered a number of uh, variables. Uh, we considered at what level of prevalence had studies been done 
which showed that MDA was an effective strategy. Uh, and Andrew Steer showed a number of those studies in his talk yesterday. And the lowest prevalence that it had been done was about 11 or 12 percent. Um, and so that helped people coalesce around the idea of a, a 10 percent threshold. Of course, no one has ever done a trial to compare if there's something magic that happens at 9% scabies compared to 11% scabies. And so at some point you have to draw a line in the sand and that seemed like a reasonable line. Uh, and then we were very much informed by our program partners about the frequency with which they want to make planning decisions. So a Ministry of Health in general, it doesn't want to be making a decision on the fly every year. It wants to be able to say, okay, now for the next three to five years, we can set out a work plan for the department. Um, so I think there are a mix of those programmatic decisions uh, and science coming together. I think the most important thing is um, the ability to reflect on, revise, and l change those guidance as information applies. I think the m biggest mistake we can make is say, well, five years ago we wrote down that we would do three rounds of mass drug administration if the prevalence was 10%, and in 20 years' time that we're still all acting like that. So I think we need to become a bit more flexible about renewing and revising guidance as more information becomes available. We need to iterate more aggressively on our guidelines. I know that can be challenging for WHO, which has a very formal guideline process. So we need to find ways to work with our partners at WHO to allow us to uh, iterate implementation guidance without necessarily going through the whole guideline process. Probably someone at WHO can speak to that better than me, but I think that's the strategy. Okay, merci beaucoup. Okay, thank you very much, Michael. Uh, there is uh, another person who would like to take the floor, but I'd like to ask you to please keep your uh, questions for the uh, Q&A session and the discussion. Since the presentation is ready now, I'd like to for to uh, Yves Barogi. Thank you very much. Uh, most African countries uh, must have received the questionnaire that we sent out. Uh, so I'm here to share some of the uh, preliminary findings of the study that was carried out in the 47 countries of the WHO Africa region. I would like to start this presentation with uh, a bit of history. Let's go back to the 1950s and the map that you can see here is the prevalence of yours in the 1950s. Uh, and you can see that it was uh, concentrated in the intertropical zone. In the 1950s, so you'll remember the very painful injections of penicillin uh, when the encouraging results that we got. The good news is that we now have, since 2012, oral azithromycin, which gives very good results as well. We have uh, many uh, strategic documents, resolutions, the new roadmap. There are strategic documents in the African region and worldwide, and they all aim for eradication of yours. I'd like to draw your attention to this map. Here you can see all the countries and uh, in the current situation, nine countries have currently been confirmed as an endemic in Central and Western Africa mainly. Then there is 26 countries that were previously endemic and their current status is unknown. They're in grey on the map. And in green, you have 12 countries in which there is no previous history of yours. It was important for the African region to clarify the situation and help the countries set up an eradication strategy to reach the 2030 objectives. That's why we carried out this survey. It's a cross-sectional study, and it took place throughout 2022. We developed a simple questionnaire a standardized questionnaire that was sent to all 47 member states of the Afro region. What we wanted 
was to see the epidemiological situation, surveillance and case management in each of the countries. This shows uh, the countries that responded to the survey. In total, 35 out of 47 reply, um, out of 47 countries, uh, out of these 35, uh, all nine endemic countries did send responses. 19 countries who responded were previously endemic, and seven who responded had no previous history of yours. This is the profile of the respondents. Most of the respondents uh, were the uh, coordinators, program managers, or deputy program managers. Now, just some key results. We wanted to know the status of case reporting by country since 1950. Only 13 countries have reported suspected cases of yours since 1950, nine of which are the confirmed endemic countries, and four were previously endemic countries whose current status is unknown. Now, when we come to the availability of experts or institutions in the country, only one third of the 35 countries that responded have experts, minimum one and maximum eight. Half of the countries had no experts at all, and some countries didn't even know if they had experts or not. And that's why it's important to focus on capacity building in all the countries. What we wanted to know was whether your surveillance uh, was integrated in the general surveillance systems in the countries. About one third of the countries uh, said that it was included in country surveillance systems, including all nine confirmed endemic countries, and three previously endemic countries said that they had integrated your surveillance in their country surveillance system. However, as you can see, there are 23 countries who have not integrated it, and 12 countries did not respond to the survey. We also asked about documents, policy documents, technical guidelines, and only 13 countries had a policy document for yours or a technical guidelines. Uh, seven confirmed endemic countries, six previously endemic countries. 22 had no available documents, and as I said, 12 did not participate in the survey. There was also... Uh, a question about the availability of a diagnostic tests, and the results are slightly more um, encouraging here. What's even more interesting um, than the 24 countries that have available diagnostics uh, or medicines, what's uh, interesting that it, uh, is that uh, they existed in six of the countries that, that have no history of yours at all. Now, what are the main findings here? Five out of the seven countries with um, no history of yours and uh, that participated in the survey have not reported any cases uh, since 1950. And that is uh, very encouraging because that means that they could potentially be certified as free from yours. The second key finding is that your surveillance is not completely integrated. It's only integrated in 12 out of the 35 countries. All nine confirmed endemic countries, but only three of the previously endemic countries. I'm sorry, there seem to be some uh, technical problems. Yes, next. Half of the countries that responded to the survey said that there is a lack of expertise or institutions specialized in working on yours. There are WHO guidelines, they're available. However, in most of the countries, there are no technical guidelines on yours. And the situation is unknown in 12 countries. Diagnostic tests are available in seven out of the 10 endemic countries. 
and at least one of the two medicines um, for yours treatment is included in the National Essential Medicines List in all countries. What progress has been made? Um, as I said, WHO has developed a lot of guides, a lot of documents for planning and implementing the strategy for the eradication of yours. There are tools, uh, standardized tools for uh, collection and reporting. There are training materials. There is technical support. And uh, WHO has been uh, promoting skin integration and the strategic framework for skin NTDs. In the Afro region, we have developed a guide to help these countries develop an integrated strategic plan and consultants have been hired. So we're encouraging all Afro countries to develop their own integrated strategic plan. WHO has uh, um, strengthened uh, collaboration, coordination and partnership. Uh, um, and this allowed us to secure a donation of 153 million tablets of azithromycin. The drugs are therefore available. Um, we are also uh, monitoring um, ant antibiotic resistance uh, and um, ensuring the provision of rapid diagnostic tests. So this, these are photos from the Congo Basin. We have also set up total community treatment in the Congo Basin. You heard uh, Dr. Alphonse yesterday who gave a presentation on this. We were able to also support countries in the implementation of uh, surveillance and target total treatment in six other endemic countries. You have a list below. As I said, not only does the Afro region encourage and help countries to set up their integrated strategic plans, but we also help them with the implementation of integrated surveillance of skin NTDs. Um, here are some of the photos of the screening that was carried out and helped us to identify yours in some of the countries. There are also um, other diseases, uh, suspected cases of scabies, um, uh, broadly ulcer, leprosy, and other skin conditions. Uh, However, there are still some uh, challenges that we're facing. The major challenge, and that's why I put it in red, is uh, resources for implementation. We have the guidelines, we have the medicine, but there is insufficient funding for implementation. There is also a lack of expertise in the countries. Um, another challenge that we're facing is a weak integrated surveillance system for um, yours and countries, and uh, we s still do not know the status of 26 countries. Um, there's also a potential emergence of drug resistance. So what are the next steps? And here I'd like to draw everyone's attention to the next steps that are recommended for the nine confirmed endemic countries. They need to implement the MORD strategy for capacity building, mapping, etc. And you see the list of the nine countries concerned on the right-hand side. For the 26 countries whose uh, status is yet unknown, there are two possibilities. If the country believes that there are no current cases of the disease, uh, then the country needs to complete the declaration of status uh, and complete the country dossier uh, according to the eradication procedure. If the country cannot conclude that it no longer has the disease, uh, then uh, they need to assess their status uh, and conduct clinical surveys, uh, especially among children under the age of 15, and particularly they should carry out serological surveys among children from one to five years of age. Uh, in both cases, they need to implement the more strategy in consultation with the World Health Organization. Just a reminder of the countries concerned. In gray, you have the uh, 26 previously endemic countries. In the 12 countries in green, so with no history of yours, they need to prepare a dossier to certify that they are non-endemic for yours. They need to document their claims and give evidence 
also that the health and surveillance systems are sufficient uh, to detect any imported uh, case. You have the list of the countries concerned on the right-hand side from Algeria all the way down to South Africa. To conclude, I would like to say uh, that we encourage all countries uh, to strengthen your surveillance, integrate yours uh, into their NTD master plan, organize uh, surveys at national and subnational levels. So you should be able to classify your health districts so that we know whether they're currently endemic, previously endemic. Uh, that will help to develop strategies for each district. And we also encourage all the countries to promote and conduct um, bottom-up survey for yours eradication throughout the country. Thank you very much. We would like to thank all the partners uh, who've uh, supported the Yours Eradication Strategy and uh, the implementation of the Integrated Skin Entities Framework. Uh, the links are available on my presentation, and uh, here you can find the procedure to follow to submit your dossier. Thank you for your attention. Merci, Dr. Barogi. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Barogi. Uh, you uh, told us about the endemicity of those 47 uh, countries, but you also gave us uh, um, some advice about how to prepare for the eradication of yours, and you highlighted the problems uh, um, that currently exist in these countries, uh, especially the fact that there is still a certain number of countries, uh, 26 countries, who do not know their status. Uh, there is also a lack of expertise in countries, insufficient integration in country surveillance systems, and a lack of national policy documents. You reminded us of the strategies that apply to the countries based on their status, and you encouraged the countries to implement an integrated strategy to pool resources and get better results. I think we can move on to the next presentation on the prevalence of skin neglected tropical diseases and superficial fungal infections. In two peri-urban schools and one rural community setting in Togo. And this will be presented by the uh, coordinator of the program in Togo. You have the floor. Thank you. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to uh, present uh, the work that was carried out in uh, collaboration with the University of uh, Southampton with uh, Dr. Michael uh, Head who was supposed to be giving this presentation, but we actually worked together to prepare it. This has already been published in the Neglected Tropical Diseases Journal. As you said, it is a study on the prevalence of skin neglected tropical diseases and superficial fungal infections in two schools um, in a peri-urban setting and one rural community in Togo. And these are the people who worked on the study. Just a few words about Togo. It is a country between uh, Benin uh, to the uh, east and Ghana to the west. It's below Burkina Faso. And the schools uh, in the peri-urban setting were just outside the capital city in the south, and the uh, community, rural community setting was uh, 750 kilometers north of Lomé and 150 kilometers away from the nearest large town. 
The main objective of this study was to determine the prevalence of skin NTDs and superficial fungal infections in two primary schools, some just outside Lomé, so in a peri-urban setting, as I explained, and in a, a rural setting in the north of the country. The objective was to identify um, the people with those skin infections and find out if they'd experienced any associated stigma and uh, to describe the site of lesions in diagnosed scabies cases. This is uh, the methodology that we used. Uh, we um, received ethical approval uh, from the uh, Togo Bioethics Committee and from the Research Ethics Committee of the University of Southampton. The two primary schools were located on the outskirts of the capital city, Lomé. The rural community was in the northeast of uh, Togo, uh, about 160 kilometers away from the nearest city. This study was based on uh, sites um, which would accept and to welcome our researchers. So we wanted to, uh, to have access to these sites. And so we asked dermatologists based in Togo to examine the skin of the study participants. The uh, diagnosis was mainly uh, clinical because it wasn't necessarily possible to carry out uh, paraclinical confirmation of the cases. And for each of the participants that we examined, we asked for a second opinion, an opinion of another dermatologist um, to confirm the diagnosis, if there was any doubt. Where infections were diagnosed, treatment was made available, f uh, free of charge, yeah. and or the cases were referred to specialist health care centers. Um, the examinations um, took about 10 minutes per participant. Then the data was collected processed and uh, as I said we also ask questions about stigma amongst the participants. Um, in total in Lume in the two schools in the peri-urban setting the sample size was 287 patients and uh, in the rural community school, the um, estimation in that village was 3,000 inhabitants, and the sample size was around 788, with a 3% margin of error. These are the results. In total, Skin examinations were carried out on uh, 1,400 people, uh, if we combine both sites. Uh, in G, so in the rural community, uh, 954, 447 across the two uh, schools in uh, Lumi, just outside Lumi. In total, we observed uh, 105 uh, cases of skin NTDs, 7.5%. In Lume, so within the schools, we had 20 cases of skin NTDs, 4.5% um, of participants in the study, and in the rural community setting, we identified 85 cases of skin NTDs, um, 
so 8.9% of those enrolled in the study. If you consider the age, we saw that there were 68 cases amongst children and 37 in adults. In total, 333 observed mycoses across all sites. But if you look per site, only 14.1% within schools had superficial fungal infections and 227, 270 sorry, in the rural community, 28.3%. Uh, Here is a table with all of the results of this study. And what's interesting is that uh, there is a prevalence of 7.5% of skin NTDs observed throughout the study, and scabies is the most common disease. 6.1%, so 86 cases in total. There were also um, a few cases, there are two cases of leprosy, one of Varudiosa, and 16 yours. And as I said, uh, uh, this is clinical observation. There was uh, no paraclinical confirmation of these studies. There, were, uh, there was a high number of observed mycoses as well. 23.8% uh, in total of superficial fungal infections. And the most frequent type was the pretoriasis versicolor. So as we explained in the case of uh, scabies patients of the 86 cases we found, uh, we had to look at the sites of the scabies lesions. And the widest known is one, the buttox, the wrists, and uh, in the interdigital areas. And that is what we see in the literature as well. So we also researched if there were issues of stigma when it came to skin infections and we also request, researched that with all of the patients. In the two schools in Lome, we had five children with cutaneous skin infections, and they reported being stigmatized because of their infections. Four of them had uh, refused to go to school. In the rural community, we saw 44%, 12, 44 pa participants, 12% of them, who reported having experienced stigma, and 93% uh, of them, that is uh, 41 of them, had missed at least uh, one day of school or wo work because of the stigma attached. So even if our results are not uh, fully representative of the whole situation in Togo, there's uh, a huge socio-economic uh, impact which is linked to the neglected tropical diseases of the skin. And we have some challenges. Above all, it's linked to limited resources. We would have liked to have carried out a longer longitudinal study on a larger scale. We also, even if we were able to have dermatologists performing examinations and to and that we were able to seek second opinions. We weren't able to uh, confirm some of the diagnoses. The participants we recruited, uh, 
were also not easy to recruit. Uh, only 57% of the students were examined in the school city because setting because some parents refused permission for examination. We must say that this study took place uh, during the COVID pandemic where there was a great deal of fake new news around and people were afraid there were many parents who felt that it might involve vaccination, and so parents uh, refused. Around 40% of uh, parents refused examination. But the limitations here are also when we're not sure if children were absent from school on days of examination because they were suffering from stigma, did they have skin infections, it's impossible for us to know that with the study. So the characteristics, as I said, of the participants meant that they could not be representative of the wider institutional and community populations. So to come to our conclusions, there is nevertheless a high burden of uh, cutaneous NTDs and fungal infections in school and community settings in Togo. Scabies was the most prevalent uh, skin NTD, which represented 6.1% of cases. And we also think that an integrated uh, management approach, either through a mass drug administration program, could also be effective in the most affected areas and could be appropriate for the management of these NTDs in those areas. However, we still need to work on reducing uh, the associated stigma within schools and in rural settings uh, when it comes to NTDs. It's also just as important to ensure that we have improved uh, training and capacity building as well as health promotion and education, both of the general public, of parents, of pupils, and community leaders, so that we can ensure that they are rapidly managed and treated. We have a great deal of superficial mycosis, as you can see, and uh, maybe a consideration is whether we should formally include them under skin NTDs. It's also important that we have more research uh, within Togo and also in Africa in general so that we can better understand the impact of uh, skin NTDs on the population uh, in rural and peri-urban areas, that we can gain a greater understanding of the stigma and the potential impact on a socio-economic level and to look at the impact and the effective treatment of these mycoses, the superficial mycoses, and because of the drug resistance we are starting to find in many areas. So I'd like to thank everyone in particular, all those uh, at the University of Southampton who have supported our study, and the full list of uh, co-authors is here and who helped us carry out our work. So I'd like to thank you. I think we are at the end of my presentation. Merci. Thank you, Dr. Yonsike, who for your presentation, as uh, with the other presentations that we saw yesterday, you've shown the importance of the uh, space that's occupied by scabies, scabies within skin NTDs in the African setting. So this uh, scabies isn't yet formally integrated into the package of most uh, national programs, uh, 
for the treatment of uh, skin NTDs in Africa. So we're going to continue in the area of parasitosis, and we're going to talk about the national prevalence and risk factors for tsongaiasis among school-going children in Kenya, and the results will be presented by Lynn Elson. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here and to be invited to speak, and um, absolutely thrilled to see tungiasis listed um, among the skin NTDs, if not the regular, the main list of NTDs. So if I can have my first slide. Um, I was hoping that uh, Professor Feldemeyer would have been here to speak yesterday so that he would have given a nice introduction on tungiasis because I think a lot of people in the room might not be familiar with this disease. So when my first slide comes up, um, I will have to do that just very briefly. Um, but I'm a career re-entry research fellow funded by Wellcome Trust based in Kenya at Kemri Wellcome Trust in Kalifi um, with a position at Oxford as well. Okay, so tungiasis is um, caused by a sand flea. The scientific name is Tunga penetrans. And it's caused by the female adult flea, which penetrates into the skin, mostly of the feet and mostly of children. Within the space of seven days, the flea grows 2,000-fold in size as the eggs develop in the abdomen. Um, and in that process, causes immense itching and pain. And then the female lays the eggs out into the environment, into the soil, usually of the um, where the rooms where the children sleep um, in houses with unsealed earthen floors. And um, as you can see in this bottom photograph here, um, it can cause incredible disability, deformity. Um, children struggle to walk. Um, they struggle to sleep at night and to concentrate on their lessons in school. So it's known that Kenya, um, in Kenya, tungiasis occurs in many parts of the country, but there's actually never been um, any surveys at a national level. We don't know the prevalence or the disease burden or the geographic distribution. And of course, as has already been mentioned, it's absolutely critical to know the disease burden and geographical distribution, and also risk factors for disease so that we can tailor our interventions appropriately. Just Geostatistical methods offer a robust approach to model the distribution of the disease using um, cross-sectional survey data. So here we're presenting the first ever national randomized, fully randomized uh, survey for tungiasis. The objectives were to um, estimate the national prevalence, um, to model the geographical variation across Kenya, to determine the number of children living with tungiasis, and to determine the risk factors for infection. So as I said, this is a cross-sectional survey. We conducted it in nine counties of Kenya, which you see labeled there on the map. And they were purposefully selected to cover the main climatic or eco-zones of the country, but also um, a widespread of different cultures. And to conduct it, we partnered with the actual counties, with the departments of health and the departments of education. And they actually conducted the surveys uh, with our financial support and they selected the teams and I trained them and because this happened during COVID I had to do all that training online remotely. Um, and then within each county um, I stratified randomly sampled 22 primary schools from each county um, so that we covered all of their sub-counties. And then within each school, the teams randomly selected 114 pupils between the ages of 8 and 14 years, which is the main age that is affected, um, but also their children who can um, answer questions in an interview. And then we also um, had a balance of boys and girls. And the survey was conducted between April 2021 and September 2022. 
And then within the main survey, we nested a risk factor survey which took place in a subsample of 95 schools. And after the children had all been screened, um, six were of the uninfected pupils were randomly selected um, and all infected pupils were selected for an interview using a structured questionnaire which covered demographic, socioeconomic, behavioral and psychosocial factors. And this is the, the first set of results. Um, so 194 schools uh, are shown here with 21,246 pupils that were examined and the overall national prevalence was 1.1%. But as you can see, um, a huge range between the counties um, from 0.1% in the county called Taita Taveta um, to 2% in Moranga and Kalifi. So then a colleague of mine, Dr. Peter Macharia, um, has been doing the mapping work for this project. Um, and here he visualized each of the schools uh, with their prevalence. The school level prevalence varied from 0%, which is the dark green spots, um, up to 25%, which is the red dot down on the southern border with Tanzania. Um, but 34.5% of all schools had at least one pupil who was infected, and 7% of schools had a prevalence over 4%. So that's the orange and red dots. And then what Peter has gone on to do is test that for residual spatial autocorrelation um, using this variogram which uh, demonstrates that there is a strong residual spatial correlation within 27 kilometers. And so therefore, geostatistical models um, are appropriate to use for mapping of Tungaiasis. And he used this information combined with the school prevalence then to do, first of all, create this map on the left, um, which very clearly shows, I think, how um, heterogeneous the distribution is, um, real clustered hotspots um, in e each of the nine counties that we surveyed. And I'd just like to draw your attention to Turkana in the um, northwest of Kenya there, those top hotspots. Um, those actually correspond to schools that serve the refugee camps. And the cases that were found there were actually refugees from South Sudan. Um, and I think yesterday there was talk about having to think about cross-border issues and how um, patients moving from one country to another could uh, carry parasites with them. And Turkana had no idea that they had any cases at all. Um, so the next step was then to combine with the population of children in these areas of the relevant age group um, and then estimate the numbers currently infected, um, which gave us a total of 17,000 children four and 423 just in the nine counties and just in this age group. Now, we haven't gone on yet to do the correlation with other factors that are mapped, such as climate and soil types, that's taking place, which will then enable us to predict um, to the rest of the country where we might find uh, high prevalence sites. So moving on, looking at the risk factors for tangiasis, this is for the whole population of 21,000 pupils. Um, clearly, as we'd seen before, there's a strong association which, with which county you live in. Um, but also there's a strong correlation with sex. So boys tend to have twice the um, odds of being infected. That's not something that's new. It has been reported in most um, risk factor surveys for tungiasis and also the association with age. So even within this very na narrow age bracket for each year increase in age, you have a reduced risk of infection. Um, what hasn't been reported before is an association with other skin disease. I hasten to add that these were not assessed by clinicians or dermatologists. Um, they were just skin abnormalities that were recognized by the team. Um, these communities tend to be very familiar with the tinea, um, and which would have been most likely. Um, I don't know if they would have detected scabies. But anyway, children who had something else going on on their skin were three times as likely to have tungiasis. 
And then lastly, the school type. We had a lot of trouble getting into private schools. They really didn't want to participate because, of course, our children don't have tungiasis, um, reflecting the stigma that's associated with disease. But we did find some cases in those private schools that let us in. Um, but of course, the odds was nearly a tenth of the public schools. Um, moving on to the children that were selected for the interviews, and I said we had incorporated some socioeconomic variables in there, and through principal component analysis, I created this uh, factor um, that includes those 12 variables there. Um, some may be a little not the norm that you included, um, but this graph just shows you my factor on the y-axis um, correlated with the poverty rate for these counties um, that I collected from a UNDP report that was published last year, and I think you can see that my factor has quite a good close correlation to that. Um, and this is the first time that this has been done systematically for tungiasis, I believe. And in the bottom row there in the multivariable model, you can see that the overwhelming factor is poverty, um, which is no surprise, but it's the first time it's been demonstrated. Um, but even when you adjust for socioeconomic status, um, children who say they always use soap when they're washing their feet had a much lower risk, almost a tenth again, of the risk of being infected than children who say they never use soap for washing their feet. And nobody's ever asked about bed net use before in tungiasis. Um, most of the bed nets that are used nowadays, of course, are insecticide treated bed nets. Um, and children who said they sleep under them um, had half the risk of those who said they did not. And there's the association with age again. So in conclusion, we successfully completed the first ever national survey for tungiasis and came up with a prevalence of 1.1%. Um, School-based surveys do seem to be a reasonable strategy for targeting and monitoring of interventions for tungiasis, since it mostly affects school-aged children. And interventions are going to have to be very carefully targeted to be cost-effective due to the high heterogeneity and prevalence. Um, and I think interventions for tungiasis could easily be integrated into other disease programs, which um, clearly, so far as we've heard today, um, haven't been considered at all. Um, it needs to be economic support to affected families. Um, and in fact, we, so many of us feel tungiasis should be used as an indicator for families who desperately need support in a community. Um, we could possibly incorporate treatment for tungiasis into MDA programs since the people are moving everywhere through the communities. Wash programs I, uh, really need to start changing their messaging from hand washing to using soap for feet and paps and of course eyes for trachoma faces. Um, and we really need a focus on boys, particularly adolescent boys, who are at much higher risk of infection. Um, and apart from integrating um, interventions, of course, integrating uh, surveillance and mapping. And in fact, I'd just like to draw your attention to a poster which is running today, uh, which is from surveys that have been conducted by the Ministry of Health in Kenya, where they have um, good funding from the end fund for the LF surveys. They integrate STH in there because they're going into schools. And now last year, they integrated tungiasis, which is very exciting. Um, and it's enabled us to get to a lot more schools and a lot more areas um, to look for this disease. So I'd like to thank all of you and to the, particularly the nine counties who agreed to partner in this survey um, and the county coordinators all listed there who uh, really made this happen. Um, my colleague Peter Macharia, who spent the last couple of years actually in England, um, who's, been, who's doing the mapping work. My colleague Ulrika Fullinger, who's a disease ecologist and entomologist, and my colleagues at Kemri Wellcome Trust. So thank you very much. Bien, merci, thank you. Dr. Elson, for bringing to our attention this uh, frequent uh, 
but a little known uh, disease, uh, but can potentially be very disabling. And you've been able to show how in certain communities there is a prevalence that can run up to 25%, even if on a national level it's only 1.1%. Of course, we have age, gender, and uh, comorbidities with other skin infections, the type of schools. And what's important to retain is that socioeconomic conditions can explain up to 65% uh, of this infection prevalence and cofactors and uh, preventive measures such as simple use of soap and uh, wash activities can help to prevent. Before we move to our next uh, speaker, I'd like to call on all uh, participants to uh, remain online and to keep an eye on the chat section of the Zoom so that they can see questions that will be coming up. Now we are going to talk about uh, Tungaisis, uh, scabies, uh, and uh, its association with uh, podoconiosis in uh, northeast uh, Uganda. And we're going to hear about the surveillance and treatment of these infections uh, presented by Marlene Thileka. Voilà, Marlene. Marlene. Merci beaucoup. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I am Malik Thieleke. Um, I'm a pediatrician from Berlin, Germany, and I've been working with Tungaris now for 12 years. So it's great that Lynn Elson started to speak about this very unknown skin entity and gave some background information. I'm very happy to uh, be part of this very important meeting and speak today about our recent and still running project in Northeast Uganda, and in particular about the surveillance and treatment of the three skin entities, Tungayadis, Photoconiosis, babies. Um, can you put on the, yes, just go one further. Next, please. The interpreters would like to uh, point out the sound is a little difficult for interpretation at the moment. Poor body hygiene and lack of resources and infrastructure leading to poor access to water, healthcare, and education. So resource poor regions with certain climate and also geochemical factors are pred predisposed to the coexistence of multiple skin entities like Tungaisis, scabies, and photoconiosis. Here, as an example, can you see some pictures from our study area in, in northeast Uganda? They show, they show so-called manyatas, clusters of small round huts bounded by thorny hedges. They picture the simple and very poor living conditions of the people living there. Next, please. The objective of our study was to assess the prevalence of various skin conditions, such as tungaisis, scabies, podoconiosis, cutaneous lava migrants, fungal infections, head lice, septic wounds, warts, etc. Our aim was to implement a control strategy integrating diagnosis, treatment, and prevention, specifically for tungaisis, scabies, and podoconiosis. Next, please. The study population of our interventional study was the entire population of 17 villages in three sub-counties in Napak district, Karamoja sub-region in northeast Uganda. The intervention included following points on community basis. First, systemic regular case detection of skin diseases, in particular of Tungaisis, scabies, and podoconiosis. Second, health education, which comprised talking about causes of disease, risk factors, and prevention measures, as well as the promotion of hygienic measures like regular washing of feet and cleaning the house and compound, smearing floors with soil mixed with cow dung, regular wearing of shoes, washing all clothes and beddings, and put them under direct sunlight for at least six hours to kill mites. And as a third point, the regular treatment of Tungaisis, scabies, and podoconiosis. 
Tungayazes was treated by the topical application of a formula of dimethicone oils with a low viscosity, as it is found in the product NIDA. As soon as embedded centuries were reported and within regular treatment rounds. Scabies was treated twice by oral ivermectin or benzyl benzoate emulsion. Photoconiosis was treated by daily washing of the, of the feet with soap, bathing them in salty water, applying emollients and distribution of closed shoes after the swelling of the feet has decreased. We had seven follow-up rounds from February 2021 to October 2022. Next slide, please. Here are some impressions from the study site. Before the dimethicone was applied, the feet were first washed with water and soap. NIDA was applied by local village Tungayathas health workers, which were trained before in examination and treatment. An important part in the treatment of podoconiosis is the daily washing the feet with soap too, especially after they were in contact with the soil. For example, after working in the fields or after herding the animals. So podoconiosis patients were provided with soap and closed shoes, uh, which were tailored to their size of feet. Next slide, please. I start with the results at baseline, where we examined in total 4,035 people in the community. The chart on the left shows a distribution of coexistence of different skin conditions, such as tungaisis, scabies, podoconiosis, and cutana lava migrants, fungal infections, head lice, septic wounds, wart, etc. And we found in three quarters of those examined at least one skin condition, 31% had at least two, and 3% even at least three skin conditions at the same time. The second chart on the right shows the prevalences of tungaisis, gabies, and podoconiosis and the prevalences of coexistence. Tungaisis prevalence of 62.8% in the general population was the highest so far documented. More than half of the tungaisis patients had another skin condition as well, mostly scabies. 49% had tungaisis and scabies at the same time. The prevalence of scabies at baseline was 40.3%, um, also very high. We measured the prevalence of podoconiosis of 1.7%, but assume that it's actually higher, as during the intervention more and more patients showed up. As the prevalence of tungaisis, tungaisis was so high, it is not surprising that 71% of the podoconiosis patients had tungaisis at the same time. Next, please. After the baseline assessment, we started the intervention. Next. A total of, sorry, no, go back to, sorry, go back to scabies. Yeah, sorry. Uh, a total of 1,553 people were treated against scabies, of which 1,047 received ivermectin, while 506 received benzyl benzoat emulsion, dep depending on the age and weight of the patient. In the second follow-up, about four to six weeks later, 113 cases were detected in the community and were retreated. All cases cured completely, and as of now, there are no more cases of scabies reported in the project area, but many cases from outside. Next, please. This chart shows the prevalence and the intensity of tungaevis in course of the seven examination and treatment rounds. At baseline, as I said before, 62.8% of the 4,035 examined people had tungaisis. And after 21 months of systemic case finding and treatment, prevalence decreased to 7.5%. You can also see how the proportion of very severe and severe tungaisis, that is more than 100 or 30 embedded centuries, was becoming less and less, and the proportion of mild cases that is one to five embedded sand fleas increased in proportion. Some words to NIDA. It's a formulation of two dimethicone oils with very low viscosity, able to creep into the respiratory system of the embedded sand fleas, leading to lethal asphyxia within some minutes. So its mode of action is purely physical. 
Diamond decones are labeled as medical devices, not pharmaceutical, are widely used in cosmetics, and are known as standard treatment for head lice. We tested it first 10 years ago as treatment against Tungaivis in a very successful proof of principle study in Kenya. Next, please. To illustrate the effect of the treatment, here is a series of photos of a child over several weeks of treatment with NIDA. And it can clearly be seen how the number of Sandkley lesions and the associated morbidity decreased in terms of much less sign of inflammation. Next, please. This table shows how foot swelling and other symptoms changed within four months of starting the intervention of daily washing the feet with soap, bathing in salty water and applying of emollients. The mean below knee circumference decreased significantly by more than two centimeter. Around this time, those affected were given closed shoes uh, um, as a further measure. The great majority of protoconeosis patients suffered from burning sensations, itching, pain, and difficulty in walking at baseline. After four months of treatment, all these symptoms decreased significantly. Next, please. To illustrate the effect, here are pictures of a patient with protoconeosis at baseline and after four months. Unfortunately, the photos are not very sharp, but you can see clearly how the swelling around the ankle and the hyperkeratosis at the front feet have decreased. Next, please. Uh, I would like to talk about the main challenges to highlight the special features of the study area. And in the end, every intervention has to be adapted to the location. Uh, one of the main challenges was that the study population live as semi-nomadic pastoralists, and my male usually wander through the savannah with the herds. It's a fluctuating population. So not everyone was always reachable for follow-up and treatment. Mostly men were absent. Sometimes new people from outside, which were infected with Tungayavis, entered the study area and introduced new sand fleas. Because animals were mostly outside the villages, it was difficult to verify what role, what role animals play in transmission in the setting. But for that very reason, we assume that animals in this setting play a rather small role. And because the animals we examined in the study just showed few Tungaisis lesion. Um, most likely the transmission of Tungaisis takes place indoors in the huts, as another study in the same study area indicate. This means an important part of the control strategy in uh, Tungaisis is the regular cleaning of the houses and to smoothen the floors so that off stages cannot hide and cleaning is more effective. Next. Um, people in the region walk a lot and have a lot of contact with uh, silicate containing soil. Combine, combined, with the fact that, combined with the fact that most of them do not possess closed shoes, there's a high risk of protoconiosis. And skin conditions are often stigmatized, as we heard also before. Um, in Napak district, this is especially the case regarding Tungayavis and protoconiosis, as also a CAP study from us confirmed. Many of the protoconiosis patients only showed up after a couple of visits. Appropriate space and time is required to implement an effective control strategy. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, Tungaisis, Gabies and Protoconiosis are major individual and public health hazards in NAPAC district. These three skin entities can, can be diagnosed clinically without any additional tool and can be effectively treated through regular and systemic case detection treatment and implementation of hygienic measures. Prevalence of Tungaisis decreased from 62.8% to 7.5%. Prevalence of scabies decreased from 40.3 to zero, and the morbidity of protoconiosis was significantly reduced. Next slide. The key take home messages are in resource poor settings in tropical countries, the risk of coexistence of several skin entities is high. And we don't have any analyzed data yet but we assume that comorbidities increase the severity of the respective disease and the overall suffering of those affected. Second, 
skin entities such as tungaiasis, protoconiosis, and scabies benefit from the same control strategies, such as implementation of hygienic measures, such as regular washing of feet, and control strategies for skin entities in resource poor setting should address infectious and non-infectious diseases to increase cost effectiveness. The last slide, please. So I want to acknowledge our research team, Francis Motebi, Hannah McNally, Rebecca Arono, Felix Reichert, Christel Ahrens, George Mukone, and Hermann Feldmeier. We are grateful to Innovations for Tropical Disease Elimination for coordinating all the field activities in Uganda and to the field team for carrying out the examination and collecting the data. Last but not least, I would like to thank all the inhabitants of the study villages and the leadership of Napak district for the acceptance to participate in the study. Thank you, Dr. Marlene. Merci, Dr. Marlene. Thank you, Dr. Marlene, for this interesting presentation which highlighted these three diseases which have the common denominator of hygiene and sanitation in households and mm, other settings. It's key to take into account that where systematic um, studying has been carried out, we have seen that 33% of participants were able to be treated, which is therefore necessary to deal with this type of uh, disease. After finishing the first round of presentations, we are now going to move on to uh, the discussion session, taking into account that we are a little bit behind in our timing, so we will reduce the discussion slot to 10 minutes. Della Smith has a question for Michael Marx, and then I would also like to ask the two questions which were posed in the chat, which are for Dr. Thelike, who asked to, to um, or they're asked by a dermatologist, which basis on which basis is the, confirma the confirmation of the diagnosis often done? And for Dr. Elson, how do you explain the fact that uh, sleeping under a, a mosquito net as a protective factor um, can reduce the tungiasis? How does it reduce it when taking into account that it is transmitted by a sandfly? Those are the questions that are asked in the chat. Now I'm going to give the floor first to Darla Smith and then Michael Marx. Dr. Yusuke and Dr. Elson. You have the floor. And my name is Dal Smith, and I am with the CDC, the Mycotic Diseases Branch. And I was just curious, there's a lot of great data that you all presented, but it's more localized. And I was kind of curious everyone's thoughts on using statistical modeling to kind of get better true burden, not true burden estimates, but better burden estimates so that we can use that data for, for action and advocacy. Um, so I'd love anyone's thoughts about how surveillance data that we are collecting or will collect in the future can be used for modeling statistically to figure out how we can better use some of that data. Uh, maybe I'll have a first go. Lynn may want to talk because she just discussed that, I guess, in Kenya. But I think the problem is most of those models rely on you having some actual data to train the model on. So we're not really in a position where we can train a geostatistical model on the detection of yours because we don't have uh, good enough data. So that's thing one. Thing two is, in general, those models work best when there is either a vector uh, which you can predict geospatially because it has certain uh, conditions, or something like protoconiosis, uh, where there's a very clear geochemical uh, risk factor. But for example, for scabies, there is no vector, there is no uh, geochemical factor, so it's, I think it's unlikely that we're going to do clever geostatistical modeling. Uh, so I, I think for some of the NTDs, for Beruli, for yours, for PODO, th these techniques can definitely be powerful, but we have to have the underlying epidemiological data. We can't interpolate when we have no data to start from. 
Merci, Dr. Gnossica. Thank you. Dr. Gnossica, you have the floor. I would like to ask each speaker to be as concise as possible so that we can catch up on time. Dr. Gnossica, thank you very much. That double confirmation wasn't done for each illness. For most of the illnesses, the dermatologists were able to recognize it. Ex for the neglect, uh, the skin NTDs, which are quite rare and aren't recognized in daily work, for example, it's important to refer them to members of the team who are be more able to recognize them, especially for BU and leprosy, uh, leprosy to obtain that double diagnosis. For other um, illnesses like mycosis and others, uh, there is no need for that dual diagnosis. Thank you. Merci, Dr. Thank you. Dr. Elson, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, just about the modeling, I would agree with uh, what Michael said. And one of the things I think is you saw the risk factor analysis that I presented, largely is there's a, a strong factor is behavior. And how do you model that and predict what's going to happen somewhere else? Um, so yeah, we are trying to do that. this mapping for Kenya and the rest of the country that we haven't surveyed, um, but it is tricky. Um, the other issue was about the bed nets and how they might be involved in protecting people. Um, well, as I mentioned, most of the nets that are available are insecticide treated. It's quite possible that they're a, a physical barrier for the eggs dropping from the foot to the floor or for the adult flea jump, jumping up onto the bed. Um, or as an egg passes through a bed net, maybe it brushes against the insecticide and that will prevent the egg from hatching, but of course that's all conjecture. Um, it needs to be confirmed with further studies and we'd love to have some funds to do some prevention trials, um, but not easy to get. Thank you. Merci, nous allons prendre un code. Thank you very much. There are another couple of questions. Firstly, Claire and then Dr. Daniel. This is a, a short question. Um, it was actually for Lynn and possibly Marlene. You didn't, I didn't, I may have missed it, but did you record whether your children wore shoes? Because obviously shoes are the new bed net and they are the integrated intervention against um, soil transmitted ailments, snake bite and podoconiosis, obviously. So just wondered if I'd missed that or what, what your thoughts were, or did nobody have shoes where you are? So it's something that we always look at, what children are wearing shoe-wise, um, and it didn't come out as significant in any of the models. Marlena actually some years ago did a prevention trial in Madagascar as part of her PhD. Um, sorry, Marlena, I'm answering on your behalf. Um, I'm sure you're listening. Um, so she did this great trial where she did um, actually a, a repellent that was coconut and yojoba oil-based, um, as, and then a separate group of children were donated shoes. Um, and the shoes did not turn out to be protective in that study, whereas the repellent was. And I mean, one of the differences was is that the repellent was applied twice a day by CHVs, whereas shoe wearing was monitored. They had people sitting around the community watching who was wearing their shoes. Um, and it's very hard to enforce even children going to school. And I've had a program running in Kenya where we donated shoes. Um, and you can see children running out of the school gate, ripping off their shoes and running home um, with carrying them. So, and I've been infected while wearing shoes. So, Tunga is uh, so voracious at getting to its host. Um, so you really need a good pair of hiking boots and insect repellent to protect your feet when you're in these communities and then you don't get infected. So you're not gonna find children in these communities wearing those kind of shoes. No. I would like to add something. Okay, merci, Can you hear Dr. Daniel, vous avez la parole. Thank you, you have the floor. Okay, merci. Dr. Daniel, thank you very much. Questions, so probably also a comment uh, on Michael's presentation and as well as a question for Barogui. Uh, with regard to Michael, <clears throat> um, 
I was wondering the role of sentinel surveillance. Um, you did not mention in your presentation, but uh, as you said, uh, for most of the skin in the TDs, uh, we're using currently clinical based definitions, clinical definitions, uh, which we don't know the sensitivity of the clinical definitions. Of course, for some of the diseases, we are hearing some level of, uh, uh, some level uh, of, uh, you know, the percentage with regard to the sensitivity. However, uh, lab confirmation is really important. So uh, because of the focalized nature of uh, these diseases, and uh, they don't occur nationally. Routine surveillance is recommended. However, I see some role for um, sentinel surveillance, laboratory supported, uh, confirmation supported, S sentinel surveillance, uh, if instituted in some countries, I think will provide uh, more data that will later on also help in uh, the modeling work um, that is one question. Then second, uh, Michael, um, for, for scabies, I think you put it only on the MDA, uh, in the part with the MDA strategy, but I am a strong advocate of the IDM uh, strategy for scabies as well, uh, because, I mean, some people, they consider IDM is an individual case. It's not. It's an innovative disease management, which includes several strategies, you know, the early detection, beyond the early detection and case management, it includes surveillance, it includes health education, it includes the vector control in the IDM strategy. So um, probably uh, also, uh, as you said, I mean, uh, the MDA recommendation is for uh, population having above 10% prevalence. So uh, we need to consider people, you know, communities affected by the disease in low uh, prevalence settings, that's one. However, uh, we need also a specific recommendation, which we probably uh, need to discuss uh, later on, on the recommendation for uh, refugee setups uh, and also concentration or detention campus. Uh, in my opinion, we shouldn't keep the 10% to do MDA. So those uh, are uh, my comments, and then probably the extended role of IDM strategy after MD. Sorry for putting a lot of questions. One question for uh, Barogui. Uh, you, I think it's good uh, that you did this uh, your survey. Um, one comment is, I think uh, you have covered the, if surveillance is being done in these countries. And you say you mentioned about 13 or 14 countries are doing surveillance. However, uh, you didn't tell us if there is a notification system. Really, a mandate. I think for U.S. eradication, we need to go for notification. We need to push for notification. We should not shy and limit our service into routine surveillance if we are really to eradicate this disease. Uh, and then uh, the, the respondents included only national program managers, deputy directors, etc. But in the past, in such kind of diseases which do not have national programs or national control programs, I think it's better to include uh, specific treatment centers, specific centers or academia groups, you know, or NGOs who are doing the real work to provide the data, because the Ministry of Health may not have the data, so uh, that's a comment. Thank you. Merci, da Danielle. Thank you, Danielle, for those comments. I will ask uh, Mark and E and Dr. Barogi to answer in the second discussion session. I will give the floor to Marlene for one minute so that she can answer the question that was raised for her. You have the floor. Um, can you hear me now? Hello? Yeah, yes. Uh, oh, okay, great. You. Yes. I just wanted to add a short um, thing regarding shoes as a prevention measures in Tungai. This, um, as 
transmission transmission of Tongaia. This happens very often indoors, as I indicated before, and people mostly don't wear shoes indoors. Um, this is not a very meaningful um, strategy at the end. This is uh, all I wanted to add regarding the shoe topic. Thank you. Merci, merci, Marlene. Thank you, Marlene. We will now move on to the second session of presentations. Before that, though, we were recommended to stretch our legs this time, so we will stand up to stretch a little bit so that we move our joints and, and enable our blood to circulate a little bit. Alors, on Stretch up, stretch up, or try and touch the sun of Africa. Stretch up as much as you can. Now, because we're at the headquarters of the WHO, we're going to try and write WHO with our hips. WHO. Voilà. Good stuff. So that'll limber us up a little bit. And now we will be able to start the second session. And we'll be a little bit more awake. Thank you. Very well. We're going to start with the second set of presentations. Which, will, um, which the first one is on Yours Evaluation in Côte d'Ivoire. Then we will look at mapping methods of skin NTDs in Malawi. Then we will look at scabies mapping in Australia. And lastly, the development of an integrated surveillance system, community-based surveillance system in Cameroon. So I'm going to give the floor to Dr. Coffey, who will speak about the endemicity of yours in 24 health districts in Côte d'Ivoire. Dr. Coffey, you have the floor. Merci, uh, Dr. Thank you, Chair. I'm pleased to speak about the evaluation of yours in Côte d'Ivoire. Next slide. Oh, it's not working. Oh, it is. Next slide. As Dr. Barouigui said earlier, since the 70s, it is, the, it is endemic in Côte d'Ivoire, and there have been lots of vaccination interventions. But since the 70s, there has been no other in precise intervention against this uh, disease. But the health system has continued the notification of suspected cases. In 2018, we had diagnostic tools working with the WHO and the support of the WHO. We were able to officially confirm the presence of yours in the three health districts. We wanted to have basic data, so we carried out this evaluation that I will show you now. We uh, carried it out in 15 health districts and we carried out routine data collection in nine other districts. The, aim, the overall aim was to understand these, uh, your situation in the country, and the aim was to strengthen the surveillance system in the country and to elaborate an eradication plan, and also to strengthen the capacities or uh, of the stakeholders and to diagnose other NTDs as well. Next slide. To carry out this study, we decided to look at the whole country and divide it into five zones. As you can see on this map, there are three large zones, one in dark green, one in light green, which are both zones that have different climates and different vegetation. 
that's how we decided on our zones. The northern zone is where there is very little rainfall. The m zone in the middle is where there is forest and m average rainfall. And the south is made up of a, a heavily forested area with a high rainfall level. We built the we ch chose these districts based on reports from the uh, annual health uh, health statistics. Once we had done that, we moved on to the preparatory phase, in which involved acquiring all of the logistic tools such as tests, medication, etc. We trained the local community actors, and then we. Mm, had so also had social mobilization, which was also key in our of a key part of our study. In the investigation or the study phase, we actively detected cases based on the integrated intervention method. Each intervention had three uh, three weeks to find cases. The target population were children between tw 2 and 15 years old who were or aren't, uh, are or aren't in schools and adults who weren't excluded. These children could be taken from any district. We asked the nurses to go to every village in their district uh, except in the big uh, towns, the cities. The community workers then were asked to, to register all of the suspected cases, so all children who were suspected have a case, and in all of the households. They were asked to, to note down all of the children that they checked between 2 and 15 years. So the ch children who took part in these activities were key. And we were able to note, uh, to take into account all of the, diff the number of children that were in the different schools. That was key as well. The nurses then went out into the communities and started testing the children that had uh, skin lesions. They mm, then they tested the, those children that presented uh, skin lesions and then a second test was done with the TP, DPP test or the rapid diagnostic test. Then we registered these on the, in the child's dossier and we re registered them in the DHSI2 which is a, a database. The positive cases were treated with azithromycin. The supervision and monitoring was carried out at a central at the level by Anasvad, which is a partner, and particularly by the WHO. The WHO was there to monitor all the activities and to rectify any errors, etc. concernant le matériel, je parlais tantôt. I was talking about logistics. Uh, we used the um, RDT and DPP tests. Um, you know, our partners made kits available to all the districts, and we thank them for that. Uh, and uh, we had a certain number of vehicles, um, motorbikes, 21 motorbikes, for the health districts, and two cars. Uh, um, this is just to show you the difficult conditions in which they were working. Uh, this car is stuck in the mud um, for the remoter zones that they had to use motorbikes. Uh, these are the children patiently waiting for their turn. They're queuing to be examined and uh, tested. On the right-hand side, you have the negative tests, uh, and right at the bottom, you have a positive case of yours. I talked about the support we received from WHO. On this photo you can see Dr. Barogi and he's showing us how to use the DPP microreader. This is a demonstration for the nursing staff uh, so that they can 
read the results. Now, as for the results, in total, we investigated in 3,920 municipalities, including um, villages, and that corresponds to 365 health zones, health areas in Côte d'Ivoire. There were 24 health districts, out of which 18 were endemic. The number of children that we examined in these consultations was 526,000. And in this table, you can see the overall results. The total number of children examined, over 500,000 children in total. The number of people with lesions, 13%. So that's out of that total number of children. And all of those children were tested with an RDT. It, these weren't necessarily suspected cases of yours. We automatically tested anybody with skin lesions. Out of those children tested, 639 were positive. So you can see that there is a serological marker of yours in their blood results. Those who received a positive RDT were tested using DPP, and 38% of the 639 were DPP positive, so were confirmed cases of yours. But if you look at what that represents out of the total population, examined, that's 0.35%, and that can be considered as the yours prevalence rate for all of the districts. Subsequently, we tried to break down all of this data by age in blue you have the positive RDT and in orange DPP, so confirmed cases. You can see that the uh, 7 to 10 or 7 to 15 age group was the most greatly affected. But we would need to discuss the zero to six year age group further because there are some that may be undetected. You can see out of 16 samples, 25% were yours according to the Pasteur Institute, 68% uh, were Haemophilus ducre and 6% were co-infections. Next please. On this slide, we wanted to show you the uh, villages and municipalities uh, that were investigated within a given health district. It's hard to see on the overall map, uh, but we just wanted to show you that within a health district, we travel everywhere. It's not a targeted zone. We want to really reach out to every single village in the health district. Dr. Coffey, you still have two minutes to finish your presentation. Next, please. These are the results, um, positive and negative results, and the distribution in the various health zones. This is a bar chart representation of the distribution by endemic district. The first few districts were the ones treated for trachoma in 2022. I think that's interesting to highlight. Next slide. What other lesions were detected? There were cases of Borreliosis, 
leprosy, scabies, you can see photos on the right hand side. And there are other types of skin lesions. Now what are the main challenges? Uh, we need to improve logistics uh, and continue to improve the mobility of the district teams uh, and uh, we need to set up and develop a plan to continue this mapping exercise and to make sure that there is full engagement of all the stakeholders um, so that we can then look into MDA. Uh, to conclude, I could say that the evaluation of yours in these 24 health districts um, let us confirm that there is a low prevalence of yours in uh, Cote d'Ivoire, but it is endemic. There are uh, other skin entities, uh, but the challenge is to make sure that we have the necessary means to uh, keep uh, working on control and eradication of yours in the country. Next slide, please. Uh, on this photo of a young schoolgirl receiving uh, drugs, we would like to thank all of the partners who supported us, uh, of course the World Health Organization and uh, ECOWAS, along with our other partners who helped us throughout the study in all the health districts. Thank you. Uh, thank you. We're now going to give the floor to Christina Galvan Casas. I'd like to ask the next speakers to please stick to the time that you've been given. Please, in fact, try to make up for lost time if you can. Thank you. Christina, you have the floor. Thank you very much for the invitation and a special remembrance for the many people severely affected for the fl uh, by the floods in Malawi these days. So, oh. Oh. so we are fortunate that Skin Exam offers an opportunity to identify multiple uh, conditions in a single visit because many of them coexist in same population groups, may be avoided or the sequela lessened by prevention or early diagnosis, and share the same treatment or can be treated with different drugs during the same intervention. And what are the strategies and objectives that we, that we can jointly address? First, training on the recognition on skin diseases prevalent in the area, neglected or not. For instance, it's useless to master the recognition of Hanseniasis if we are not aware of the differential diagnosis with other skin entities. Preventive measures and treatment. And who should be trained? All those engaged uh, with healing, academic and non-academic professionals, traditional healers, we should join in a mutual learning relationship. And for prevention training, general population, and most usefully children at the schools should be also engaged. Wide areas like sanitary control and active detection of cases. And this means that the official prevalence figures are very different from the real ones. And the different measures to be taken depend on these figures. Active, active case detection is a very hard and resource consuming task and is therefore necessary to deal with mapping, evaluation and surveillance in an integrated way. My lecture will reflect my experience as dermatologist in rural Malawi within the Dermalawi project active since 2015. The basis of our work are the dermatologic clinics held in the rural health centers from Kota Kota and Salima districts and the teledermatology network, which operates 24, 675. 
Data collection in the health centers allows to recognize red flags and define the objectives, the specific needs that suggest an integrated control strategy. And closing the circle, mass screening program activities make it possible to detect other dermatological diseases which will be referred to the clinics for adequate control. Mm. As it happens in similar projects, the most common skin diseases include fungi, pyoderma, scabies, acne, eczema, and warts. It's striking that leprosy was among the most frequent pathology, accounting for almost 3% of people attended in the first two years of the program. Of course, this is not the prevalence, since it is an indirect observation within the patients who voluntarily came to the clinics. In a country where this condition is not considered a cause of concern, I guess due to lack of access to a diagnosis, leprosy is our first red flag. These figures, these figures, excuse me, uh, have exponentially increased because delayed by the COVID-19 pandemic, we started implementing contact tracing in June 2021. In addition, the awareness generated drives patients to come to the clinics. And as an example of all these new diagnoses, all of them young or very young people, and all of them at a very advantaged stage. The second red flag was the large number of ulcers in children and in lower limbs. Most of them were painful and self-healing. Like these ulcers I am presenting to you, which are so alike and yet so different. And the most pressing red flag was scabies because of the number of patients treated and the maintenance of the upward curve despite the many efforts to treat cases and contacts and training talks. Scabies all, at, in, in all ages, all its manifestations, mostly chronic and close contact shared. The percentage of patients consulting for scabies was increasing exponentially to almost 40% of the total in March 2018. What was going on? Cycles certainly was not seasonal. M of MDA with ivermectin for lymphatic filariasis in 2014 in the country? Maybe. The fourth red flag was malignant tumors in the albino population, some of them in a very advantaged stage. As you can see, some red flags were generated by numbers, as in scabies and others, by diagnostic and therapeutic urgency to prevent severe disability or death, such as hanseniasis, and tumors. Then health and educational local authorities asked us to move the clinical activities to communities and organize an intervention integrating the diagnosis and mapping of the pathology neglected or not that had generated concern. Our objectives were to know the actual prevalence of scabies and to implement a more effective treatment method that could reverse the epidemic to know the cause of the, uh, the causative agent of the ulcers, to bring leprosy diagnosis and treatment close to the patient, and to treat premalignant or malignant pathology as early as possible in the albino population. To achieve then, the decision was to organize a mass screening and treatment campaign for scabies. This required a full dermatologic screening of as many inhabitants as possible in the target area. During MSDA, we obtained samples for diagnostic molecular analysis of the ulcer swab. Every suspected leprosy case was recorded and referred to the dermatological clinics, transferring the patient when needed to provide early diagnosis and treatment. And we recorded cases of albino scheroderma pigmentoso to enable the treatment, the treatment of premalignant or malignant pathology as soon as possible. The first point to implement these strategies are the teaching activities that, that allow trainers, volunteers, health workers, village agents, and translators to successfully carry out the proposed activities. 
We organized courses and a skills workshop. We relied on algorithms and validated training programs and guides. And we also developed diagnostic supporting guides specific for this program. We dermatologists had, to, had much to learn about the geography and customs. We all had to get familiar with the program's methodology, questionnaires, diagnostic and treatment guidelines, as well as good clinical practice criteria. And local workers had to learn to recognize skin pathology. The second point is to raise public awareness. So we set up local information networks, rounded off with loudspeaker announcements and talks. Mass screening and treatment previously used in jaws, syphilis, chlamydia, and TBC consists in, the screening, in screening the entire population of a geographic area, regardless of symptomatology. Standard of care is offered to all cases and available contacts. Its objectives are to know the prevalence, to reach the cases and contacts who do not consult post-symptomatic forms, lack of means to get to the hospitals, and to reduce the parasite reservoir in the population and thus limits its transmission. The dermatological exam had to consider our four targets, scabies, leprosy, ulcers, and albino malignant tumors. In three occasions, a 62-people team visited the 30,000 uh, inhabitant area of influence of the Alinafe Hospital. Our working instruments were the ODK questionnaires collected on mobile phones or tablets, the dermatoscope, and a camp cupboard to preserve privacy when the skin exam could not be done indoors. We visited the nine schools in the area, class by class. We took a census, registered and examined one by one all the children to analyze the presence or absence of the target pathology. From now on, from now on I will focus on scabies, uh, the most numerous pathology diagnosed. In the case of a single positive scabies case, we treated the whole class as contacts and the positive ones as cases. Subsequently, we went to every village related to each school, sweeping the area, neighborhood by neighborhood, house by house, numbering them, and checking all possible inhabitants. We treated cases and contacts and checked where the positive school children live in order to treat their families as contacts, even if they were not clinically affected. Treatment, treatment followed standard of care and recommendations for population-based intervention with oral ivermectin, stepped in pregnant women, breastfeeding women, and children under 15 kilos who were prescribed topical permethrin. We gave two doses to every case, one at the time of the first visit and the second dose one or two weeks later. Contacts received one dose at the time of the visit, for hyperkeratotic scabies, we gave double doses and associated topical oral treatment, but there were no cases of hyperinfestation, so we did not treat fomites. And we instructed both local agents and population to contact us immediately in case of any suspected adverse reaction. We marked with unbreakable and non-interchangeable wrist runs of two different colors donated by the organization of a rock music concert. And the objective was, was to avoid repeating doses in the same child during our visit, to know whether the child was treated as a case or as a contact on arrival at the family home, and to know who must receive a second dose a week or two weeks later. And these are the results. For, all, for us, it has been a great success, and we are very pleased to verify that the prevalence has dropped from an alarming 17% of the population to a much less worrying 2%. As drawbacks, the main difficulty is coverage. Population spends little time at home, and there is significant school absenteeism. It is also difficult for cases to come for the second dose or to agree to be examined in subsequent rounds once they are feeling better. 
The feeling of violation of privacy makes it difficult to carry out a complete dermatological exam and supervise the correct application of the cream. It is true that in a very high percentage of cases, we can diagnose scabies without removing clothing, but in this way, we miss the opportunity to investigate other conditions. So it's imperative for teams to be composed of male and female clinicians. Screening and field treatment uh, is a very pleasant and rewarding task, both from the human and professional point of view, but it requires significant effort in terms of time and human resources. Fatigue is a constant and difficult working conditions such as heat, rain, dust, mud, make it difficult to apply cream, visualize the burrows, and use the dermatoscope and tablets. As conclusions, the prevalence of scabies is very high in the area covered. Community-based case, de case detection and treatment programs are successful in reducing the prevalence of scabies and should integrate other alarming pathology in the area. Current treatment offer dosing and administration difficulties in mass programs, so new drugs, dissemination models, and treatment and prevention strategies are needed. Despite the reduction in the prevalence of scabies, the infestation continues to be a health problem in the area. And the priority objective of scabies included in the new WHO roadmap should be considered in Malawi. As take home messages, we must take advantage of our, the characteristic of our target organ, the skin, to address prevalent pathologies in the same intervention, promote training resources, and propose population-based activities when curing the patient is not enough. I acknowledge the local and volunteer the Malawi team who conducted the, conducted the work in the communities, the Malawi Ministry of Health and the Kotakota Health Authorities, who were the first to promote this intervention, to the missionary community San Paul the Apostol, our local part, partner, and to FSCI and Spanish Academy of Dermatology, who provided financial support. I will please to hear your comments. Merci. Thank you, Dr. Christina. I'd now like to give the floor directly to Dr. Victoria Cox. Thank you so much. Dr. Cox, you have the floor. You have the floor, Dr. Cox. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Victoria Cox. I'm a medical doctor and PhD student at the Menzies School of Health Research in Darwin, the Northern Territory, um, which is at the very top of Australia. I'd like to start this presentation by recognising that at home, I live and work on Larrakia land, and I'd like to recognise the Larrakia elders past, present and emerging. I've put a picture of Australia at the bottom of the screen. The highlighted orange region is the uh, area that we're going to focus on today um, and was uh, where we conducted Healthy Skin Week late last year. For context, Darwin, the capital, has a population of around 150,000. The orange highlighted region has a population of around 250,000, with many First Nations people living in rural and remote regions. And for context, Greater Sydney has a population of around 8 million. Now, those of you who've been fortunate enough to visit Australia perhaps will be aware of our beautiful beaches, our fantastic coffee, our wonderful people, <laughs> <laughs> and um, our incredible weather. But I would like to frame this presentation by stating that Australia is a first world country with a world class healthcare system, but with third world health conditions in our backyard. And as a medical doctor and a public health practitioner working in the top end, my experience is uh, that there are significant challenges pertaining to healthcare access and inequity, particularly in First Nations people. Skin disease is one of, if not the most common cause for presentation to a primary healthcare centre in Northern Australia. 
despite this, the burden of skin disease is underreported and underrepresented on the national policy agenda, and the normalisation of skin disease continues to be a really <coughs> significant problem. Now, I don't need to tell everyone in this room that scabies is a parasitic mite infestation. Scabies is one of the most prevalent skin NTDs, and the primary burden of scabies, um, particularly repeated or persistent infections, stops little kids from sleeping and stops little kids from going to school. But the secondary burden of disease is just as concerning as uh, complications or secondary sequelae, including post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis or acute rheumatic fever or rheumatic heart disease, contribute to a significant degree of morbidity um, for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in Northern Australia. And I appreciate that this is a meeting on skin NTDs. However, um, I'd just like to recognise that rheumatic heart disease, the prevalence of RHD is believed to be among the highest in the world in the Northern Territory as well. So just a brief mention on the diagnosis and treatment of scabies. Um, of course, many of the individuals in this room were involved in developing the IAX consensus criteria for the diagnosis of scabies in field settings only a couple of years ago, level A evidence based upon the use of demoscopy, direct microscopy, and level B and C evidence um, being a clinical diagnosis based on a full skin examination um, and incorporating history features. And even in a country such as Australia, um, it is important to recognise that scabies is most commonly a clinical diagnosis. I've highlighted um, a couple of specific papers which have been published only in the last couple of years and have suggested that you can actually get very good sensitivity for the diagnosis of scabies from conducting not a complete or full body examination but from undertaking a targeted or focused examination of exposed sites. And this, of course, has great relevance for conducting large-scale public health programs or prevalence work, as, of course, um, the implication is that it's likely that conducting the skin exam, or a targeted or focused skin exam, I should say, is going to be quicker, less time-intensive, resource-intensive, um, and arguably also more culturally sensitive um, because of reduced need for um, examination or exposure of sensitive sites. Uh, just a quick mention about um, the treatment of scabies uh, in Australia, which uh, until very recently, the only sole first line treatment agent for the management of scabies was topical 5% permethrin cream and use of ivermectin only after a failed complete treatment course of permethrin. We, of course, were concerned that this had important equity implications and considerations, particularly for use in Northern Australia. So together with the National Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Organisation, or NACHO, I co-authored a submission to recommend an increase in the use of ivermectin in Australia on the pharmaceutical benefit scheme. You can see a picture of the submission on the right. Uh, it was much longer than what you can see on the screen, let me assure you. Um, and on the top left, um, we have a picture of the updated listing, which was changed on the 1st of April last year. The submission was successful, um, and now uh, ivermectin is a co-first-line treatment for use in Australia for the management of scabies in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander populations. And we're very fortunate that, as you can see on the bottom left of the screen, there's also been an update to national clinical guidelines, and we can see the co-first-line agents on the bottom left of the screen too. So um, this is quite a busy slide, but just to highlight that the aim of Healthy Skin Week, which is the focus of this presentation, and um, we conducted late last year, um, the outcome or the aim was, first of all, to determine the point prevalence of scabies, second of all, the point prevalence of common skin conditions, and of course, to determine a baseline burden of disease so that we can make comparisons when conducting follow-up or repeat prevalence surveys in the future. So Healthy Skin Week was conducted in a remote Aboriginal community in the Northern Territory, one of the largest Indigenous communities in the Top End, a population approaching 4,000 people and 500 kilometres from the nearest tertiary referral centre. So the intention of Healthy Skin Week was to enrol as many community residents as possible to undergo a simplified skin assessment um, as part of a cross-sectional prevalence survey. 
And to do this, we had a large team, approximately 25 individuals, divided into six field teams, each field team comprised of one local nurse, one local um, Aboriginal healthcare practitioner or community healthcare worker, and as well as a member of the uh, local research or study team. And all members of the study team underwent standardised training and teaching. Um, and um, we'd like to thank the World Scabies Program for sharing their resources um, to facilitate us being able to do this. A diagnosis, a diagnosis of scabies was made when three or more typical scabies lesions in a typical body distribution were present. And of course, this is from undertaking a simplified skin assessment, um, which was focused on exposed sites on the head and neck, the arms, including the hands, the legs, including the feet, and on the trunk for children aged under two years. Um, all other skin uh, um, conditions were documented and recorded, referred to the clinic when appropriate, treated in accordance with national clinical guidelines, um, and pertaining specifically to the ivermectin-based MDA treatment program, all individuals received one treatment dose, preferably ivermectin or um, topical 5% permethrin cream if contraindicated, and for those individuals with scabies um, were flagged to receive a second treatment dose seven to 14 days after the first. Moving on to the analysis, over the next uh, couple of slides, I'll just um, briefly go through a cascade of care, um, information on participant demographics and um, uh, point prevalence for each of the skin conditions um, pertaining to outcomes one and two, and then um, followed by a statistical analysis conducted using a Poisson regression analysis to assess the relationship between different outcome variables and scabies to address outcome number three. So the cascade of care, um, there are 1,390 individuals approached in the community. Almost 99% of individuals consented to undergo a simplified skin assessment. So N equals 1,372. Um, almost all of these individuals um, uh, had treatment as part of the MDA treatment program. Um, uh, and nearly 90% of individuals received ivermectin, 341 individuals had scabies, and um, 122 individuals received a second treatment dose seven to 14 days later, which is about 35%. On the left of the screen, there's a table describing the demographics of study participants, um, uh, specifically sex, age, and household demographics that we were able to collect. Um, and on the right of the screen, um, we have the point prevalence for scabies in uh, different skin conditions. Um, and highlighted in red, the point prevalence of scabies, 25.1%, impetigo, 7.1%, tinea and fungal disease, 23.1%, and 51.1% of individuals um, surveyed during Healthy Skin Week had at least one form of skin disease. And just to note that there were no cases of crusted scabies identified. The table on the left shows scabies prevalence for different subgroups, and um, probably the most important thing to highlight on this slide is that children aged zero to nine had a scabies prevalence of 43%, um, and this decreased um, uh, over the increasing age groups. And on the right, uh, the table I've highlighted the statistically significant <coughs> results in red, which suggests to the compared to the reference range, um, people aged between 20 to 29 years had a 60% reduction in the prevalence of scabies, and people with impetigo had a 64% increase in the prevalence of scabies. So overall, a quarter of the population had scabies, more than half of the population had at least one form of skin disease, and not surprisingly, younger people had a higher prevalence of scabies and impetigo was in associated with an increased prevalence of scabies. And just to note that uh, sex and household structure did not appear to have any statistically significant association with varying prevalence of scabies. There were a number of challenges with undertaking this work, particularly around the use of ivermectin, ordering pharmacy stocks. At one point, it felt like we drained the entire Northern Territory of ivermectin. The truth is probably not too far from it, um, as well as verifying and accessing contraindications to ivermectin use for the community residents, and then, of course, accurately assessing those contraindications for the individual that was um, in front of us during uh, Healthy Skin Week. 
We spent a lot of time talking about population metrics, which um, is known to be quite challenging in particularly remote Aboriginal communities um, in Australia. And of course, this had um, implications for the documented community penetration, both for the prevalence survey as well as the MDA treatment program. And there are a number of logistical challenges that we had to work through both during Healthy Skin Week and also in the lead up as well. Oop. So this was the first formal prevalence survey for skin disease conducted in the Northern Territory in over a decade. And this is important as scabies remains endemic in Northern Australia. And documenting the burden of skin disease is the first step towards ensuring we have the resources and funds to advocate for an appropriate public health response. Of course, we are looking to conduct follow-up prevalence of surveys um, at later this year at the six-month and the 12-month mark. Um, and uh, for this, we have considered whether, um, as opposed to undertaking a community-wide prevalence assessment, we will look to um, use a random sampling strategy of either individuals or using uh, residential household data um, or lot numbers in order to um, utilise a random sampling strategy to estimate the burden of scabies and common skin conditions in the community. And of course, we've already begun um, discussions around whether in the future it may be appropriate to consider a repeat MDA treatment program. And we are closely watching uh, research um, uh, determining the efficacy of a one-dose versus a two-dose treatment regimen. And I think particularly in our patient population, which is known to be transient across a large geographical distance throughout the Northern Territory, um, this is especially important as there are additional logistical challenges with um, ensuring that people with scabies receive a second treatment dose. There are a very large number of people to thank. Um, I would like to thank my supervisors and I would also like to specifically thank the um, Aboriginal leaders and elders um, who gave us cultural guidance in, in the development of Healthy Skin Week um, and specifically the local health staff um, at the Aboriginal Medical Service that we partnered with and for being so welcoming um, in welcoming us onto Gunabidji land. Thank you very much. Merci, Doc. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Cox. I am now going to give the floor straight away to uh, Dr. Ernest Taba from Cameroon. Dr. NG, vous pouvez prendre la parole. Dr. NG, you can take the floor. Thank you very much, Chair. <clears throat> uh, we count it a privilege to be here, and we want to thank Kingsley and his team for facilitating our being here. Uh, it's uh, usually a challenging task to take uh, the floor last, but I want to think that he who laughs best laughs last. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, um, we would like to present to you an integrated uh, community-based surveillance system for skin entities that we developed in Cameroon. Uh, it's not working. Slides. Okay. Okay, thank you. I think I'll get used to that. Uh, I would like to say that in Cameroon, we have about uh, 15, 15 of the 20 skin entities that are, are listed in the WHO uh, list of 20 entities, amongst which uh, about nine skin entities exist. Uh, we have had a national program that uh, brought together about four of these ent skin entities, but uh, we did not really have a functional integrated surveillance system as such. Uh, within the framework of uh, 
a project uh, funded by uh, OSIAC. OSIAC is an organization that coordinates the control of endemic uh, disease in the Central Africa subregion. Within a project funded by them and uh, KFW from 2020 to 2022, we were able to develop and implement an integrated community-based uh, surveillance system for skin entities. In fact, the goal of developing this system was to reinforce uh, an integrated early case detection and management and notification of skin entities uh, in the targeted health districts. Uh, the map we have here in green highlights the zone where the activity was carried out. Uh, we implemented this project in 20, in 20 health districts uh, at the beginning, but towards the end, it, we had 21 health districts because one of the districts was splitted into two. Uh, in, this, in setting up the system, we had a number of steps that we followed. The first step was that of developing integrated surveillance tools. And through meetings and workshops, we were able to develop a number of tools that were used at the community level, at the primary health facility level, and at the level of the health district. Mark you that all of the implementation was done at the district uh, level. So we had um, these tools that we developed. We developed uh, an integrated uh, posters or, or, and chats for uh, sensitization of the public and uh, helping them to recognize uh, lesions on the skin that look like them and then report themselves to community health workers who also had a tool, the one in the middle, a pocket guide that uh, had some write-ups using or, or a basic language that was understandable at least by them because most of these community health workers were people who had not uh, attained high levels of education, but at least they could read and write. Then there was also uh, this uh, image box that was, used, was developed for use by the primary health care work, uh, primary health care personnel, first of all for training of community health workers and also for public sensitization on the various skin entities. This was followed by development of uh, surveillance tools. We had a, a form, a very simple form that was developed for use by community health workers who would be able to suspect cases in the communities and use this form to notify these cases to the health facility where they will be received and examined for clinical confirmation. And this form was printed with uh, duplicates. One of the duplicates will be served to the patient to serve as a referral form, while another duplicate will remain in the community health worker's uh, booklet as his own documentation. Then we had, uh, we adapted uh, re report, uh, reporting tools or do for documentation of the cases that will be confirmed clinically at the level of the health facility. We had forms for leprosy, forms for BU, forms for EOS, and uh, the rest of the skin conditions that were targeted for integrated surveillance. Then we had an integrated register that was adapted from uh, a template provided by the WHO. And this integrated register was used at the health facility level. And in that single register, cases of uh, the targeted entities, namely leprosy, buruli ulcer, scabies, um, and even leishmaniasis, and uh, uh, yes, were registered in this single register. So in one place, in one uh, document, you could find information on all of these uh, skin entities as they were detected at the level of the health facility. Then we also worked with the health information system unit in the Ministry of Public Health to configure 
the reporting of or notification of these entities directly into the THIS platform. Slides, it's like, <laughs> sorry. Then the next step was that of development of training tools. We were able to develop a number of training tools for health personnel as well as training tool for community health workers. And at the end of the development of the tools, we train trainers on these tools so that in turn they could be able to cascade training of uh, health workers and uh, community health workers on uh, the surveillance system. Then followed the training of actors, uh, which started with the training of uh, the district supervisors. These were people drawn from the district management team as well as the district hospitals in the districts that were involved. In turn, the district uh, teams train primary healthcare personnel within their various districts under the supervision of um, uh, the national uh, program. And uh, the health personnel also in turn train the community health workers who were supposed to do the work at the level of the community. At the end of it all, we were able to train 358 health personnel and 1,740 community health workers. Uh, we also put in place a strong monitoring and supervision teams to work alongside the district, coaching them and helping them to do the work and put some quality in the work that they had to do. So, uh, and these teams were supposed to visit the districts at least once a month and monitor and what they do and also correct the errors that could be found. Supervision was done by the coordination team to districts that had particular problems uh, once in a while. So uh, this uh, chart here shows the system that we developed. Most of the work was done at the level of the district and at the level of the districts where uh, there are primary healthcare facilities that work with, uh, that work for a number of communities. So the community health workers in within the catchment area of a health facility will suspect cases and report them to the primary health care facility where personnel were trained to carry out clinical diagnosis and also collect samples and send them for confirmation to the reference lab. And the cases that were confirmed clinically were directly reported or uh, were recorded into the registers and then notified onto the DHIS platform or sent to the district management team to do the notification on the platform. And the district management team work with them hand in hand and to do supervision monitoring and correction of errors. This information that was sent to the district uh, DHIS2 platform could be accessed by the regional level as well as the national program for uh, collect, for, for, for understanding the data and giving orientations and feedback to the lower levels that produce this uh, data, especially the district system. And uh, from time uh, to time, the national level al alongside the regional uh, team could go to the district either for some specific uh, supervision activity or to boost the district activity with uh, active case search. And information collected at the level of the national program was analyzed and be shared with partners and the higher levels of the ministry. So uh, in the implementation phase, a number of activities were actually carried out. The forms, the, the tools that had been developed were shared to the districts for use and uh, the districts, after training, started activities uh, immediately, and then we could. Uh, we also had uh, monitoring and supervision during the phase of the implementation, and uh, and we also developed a platform uh, on WhatsApp 
uh, which will serve as an interactive platform between the primary healthcare staff and uh, the, the program and the supervision team so that uh, photos or worries could be shared and uh, corrections made or orientations given. So in the implementation, these pictures here show a number of field activities that uh, were implemented within the framework of the surveillance activities where <clears throat> uh, mixed teams, uh, beginning with the national level, the regional level, and then the districts could come together to do some work within the district from time to time. Meanwhile, uh, in the absence of uh, teams coming from the national level routinely, the district after training will be doing uh, the uh, suspicion confirmation, clinical confirmation and notification through the JIS2 platform. So this picture here, this, uh, sorry, the first slide, this slide here is the platform, <coughs> the, the, the WhatsApp platform that was developed for this interact uh, uh, coaching between the primary healthcare level at the district and the supervisors, which could either be at the level of the district, the region, or, or the national level. Everybody involved was on this platform, and once uh, the, the primary healthcare level shared a picture and needed uh, some information or orientation, immediately uh, a solution could be sought from any of the higher levels as soon as the picture was uh, seen. And uh, that helped to improve quality of uh, supervision. Through this uh, platform, we were also able to detect other conditions like the monkeypox you see on that side, which was not part of uh, our portfolio. So. Uh, this picture shows the GHIS2 platform, uh, the dashboard as the data came. Uh, we have these pictures showing the various types of uh, skin entities uh, that could be seen during uh, the activity. Then we have this form here which shows an improvement in notification through the GHIS uh, platform for routine data notification that had not been before. Between 2019 and 2020, there was tremendous improvement in the notification through this system. Uh, we also had uh, active case finding in each of these districts at least once. And in the course of this activity, 40,790 people were examined, amongst which 11% had skin entities and 16% uh, had other skin conditions that were not entities, mainly superficial fungal infection. So you will notice that about 27% uh, of all the persons examined had some form of skin lesion. The chart here shows the, uh, the various skin Dr. entities Dr. that were detected. Dr. G, we need to move towards the conclusion. The other, skin entity, the other skin conditions that we registered. Uh, we were also able to confirm yours in nine of the 20 health, 21 health districts that were not known for yours before. And uh, uh, the map there shows on, with red dots where yours had been confirmed uh, in those districts. So we think that uh, integration of uh, skin control intervention is very feasible on a very large scale, and that uh, this system has helped to strengthen the district health system and has also helped us to show the burden of new skin entities that were not known before, as well as confirming uh, yours in nine new health districts. I think uh, that my last slide, thank you. Merci, thank you, Dr. Nji, and I'd like to thank all those who have presented at this second session. We are at the end of our time allocated. We've got four minutes available for discussion. So I'm going to maybe ask for the indulgence of the interpreters to give us uh, five more minutes. 
and we'll just take two or three questions from those who are here. And then I'd ask the presenters to respond as fast as possible. Yes, sir, chair, the interpreters uh, say we can have five minutes. So Dr. Elson, Dr. Mushika, and I can, this is someone at the back, I can't read their name. Belen. So those three questions are going to be raised. So if you take the floor straight away and specify who the question is for, and then they will respond. Dr. Elson. Dr. Elson, please. Thank you very much. My question isn't to anybody specifically, but everybody who's been presenting surveys of skin NTDs in all these different countries today, um, nobody's mentioned tongiasis at all. Does that mean nobody was looking at feet and we were looking at other parts of the body, or the disease just isn't there? We'll take all the questions at once, and then we will continue. Just one question for Dr. Abwa. I found it very interesting that he tested for all the skin infections and for the yours. Did they take photos of the dermatosis that had uh, appeared? I think that would give us a holistic view of the different forms that can occur with yours. So all the photos types. Doctor, I'm afraid I don't have your name. I'm Dr. Belen Dofitas from University of the Philippines, Manila. Uh, my question is about uh, addressed to the speakers who did surveys. Um, you, you were looking for scabies, but uh, scabies and other ectoparasites actually are part of the skin NTDs. There was no mention of head lice. Did you find other ectoparasites in your surveys? Merci. Thank you. So we have uh, had three questions. So one for those who have uh, presented their studies. So I'm going to give the floor to Dr. Kofi, who is going to reply on the questions addressed to him. Thank you. When it comes to uh, tongiasis, uh, we don't have uh, cases, so we don't necessarily search for it systematically. And the second question, yes, we have got photographs of virtually all the lesions that occur. Nurses, uh, I presented some of the tests, but we also had pictures of different lesions that are sent to us on a platform so that those who don't have internet available, we can uh, pick them up, uh, all these pictures of lesions in the district level. So all lesions are photographed and recorded. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Kofi. Thank you, Dr. Kofi. I would just like to confirm that based on my experience in Benin, um, it is not systematically looked for, so we cannot affirm or confirm that it is or isn't there in a country. So that is in, in any case regarding Benin. Some uh, questions were raised, but uh, were suspended waiting while we were waiting that needs to be addressed by Michael and Barabogi. So we will give them one minute each to respond to those questions that were asked earlier, and then we will move on to the concluding questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel, for your comment. We followed official guidelines for the survey. We sent the memo to the WHO country office. That was sent to the Commissariat of the Health, or the Ministry of Health, and they identified the best person to respond to that uh, survey. We noticed that the majority of those were program coordinators. That, uh, that was, so we wanted to have an official answer that, the, that Benin couldn't contest then. 
Uh, yes, thank you. And I would like uh, Dr. Baragi, just before he has the floor, a question was on the degree of uh, engagement of the Ministry of Health in countries in the implementation of recommendations. Could you tell us a little bit about that, please? This question wasn't part of the survey, so I cannot um, respond to that in, in line with this study. Thank you. Michael? Great. I'll try and do three questions in one minute. I, my guess is the answer that the reason no one measures Tunga or head lice in surveys is it's very unclear what the programmatic implication would be, whereas it's clear what the programmatic implication would be of finding yours or scabies or BU or leprosy because there is a guidance document, so there's a space to fill there. Um, in Daniel's answer, of course, you're right that there is uh, an important strategy around scabies at lower prevalences. The provisional framework document currently describes all prevalences as of between two and 10 as an unclear zone. So we are working on the evidence to inform the strategy there. And I think we're 100% in agreement that facilities, be they educational facilities, prisons, uh, refugee or asylum seeker centers, are likely distinct entities where we need to consider those separately. And we, we know uh, that scabies is often a big problem in that setting. Bien, merci. Very well, thank you. We have reached the end of this session. But before giving the, ah, but there is one last question. Yes, I cannot see your name, but go ahead. Thank you. Australia Public Health. My question is to those who have been involved in implementing MDAs or mass treatment. How do you manage the consent process for children particularly and in people that have very poor or limited health literacy? So it's a high level question about consent for treatment. Michael, wait. I'll give an answer from a research perspective and then maybe some of my program partners. I mean, often these activities are implemented as programmatic activities requiring the same level of consent as, for example, vaccination. Um, so I think this isn't unique to MDA. Uh, I think it would be a question, how does one address the health literacy of a child about receiving a, a measles vaccine in a school-based campaign? Um, so I think this is probably a question for my program partners to say, but I think these are considered routine interventions outside of research settings. Merci. Thank you very much. Right. Well, comment on the, all the surveillance projects that the question is how are you uh, giving the treatment to these patients? And I think for every project uh, we have different situations. And but the procurement of treatment is very important in doing the surveillance. And this is also one of the questions that I always been asked when I do the projects. And so we don't have any time to receive any replies, but it's good to gather these um, stories and experiences that how you're receiving the treatment for these patients so um, that these patients are also treated. Also, just uh, one quick point on the Dr. Awa Kofi's, um, the yachts, um, you're de detecting the patients above 15 years old. And so how you're differentiating these patients against the suffetus patients. So this is one more comment. So that is all. Thank you. Merci, Doctor. Thank you for that comment. Dr. Coffey, would you like to answer? Thank you. Yes, we detected cases in people aged over 15 years. But we had that advice from Dr. Kinsley from the WHO that it's best to, to delve, or rather to look at why beyond 50 years the diagnosed cases of yours are less prevalent and why there was a link there with syphilis. We need to look into why, into adult men, adult women, um, and children, and look at the differences there. But yes, we did detect cases on the ground. But the lesions weren't typical, not unlike the yours uh, lesions. But the tests were positive. 
That I would like to confirm, yes. Thank you. We're going to close this session, but now before I give the floor to Kingsley, I would like to thank you all for allowing me to be the chair of this session. Thank you to Kingsley and thank you to the team of the WHO. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sopo and all the speakers this afternoon. Uh, I think the issue of the different screening methods or survey methods, some are doing systematic screening, some are doing randomized clustered sampling <coughs> and different methods. We have been discussing for your eradication also about the optimal uh, uh, survey strategy. Um, I think that uh, some of the information we have heard today, uh, together with other experts involved in the work, uh, we will try to also see what is the best. I mean, sure, each situation will require some adaptation. Some will do systematic screening of children, which is, which is fine, but as Michael also mentioned, when you have a rare disease, particularly like yours in some countries, where we don't even know whether it exists or not, where is your starting point? How are you going to figure out whether there are cases or not? But I think we, we have had different approaches from different countries, and uh, I think we will take some lessons from all of this moving forward. Uh, I, I see the room is full. <laughs> I, I know at the end of the day, the conference services will send me also all the people who have been in and out. I know, I'm counting, the, I'll show you the data on Friday. Uh, you, you, you'll be surprised, yeah? So, uh, yeah, thank you all. Tomorrow we will continue, uh, have some rest, L look around Geneva and those in France also. And uh, let's meet tomorrow. Thank you all, and bye-bye.